Stephen Vittoria says, Mumia Abul Jamal and I were honored to include two passage or passage from our Murder Incorporated book series. We're only reading one here. We'll uh, post the other one. The importance of the Cold War Truth Commission can be found in two places. First, right in their very name, truth, offering sanity to a truly insane chapter of history. Secondly, more truth found in the hearts of the folks who have undertaken this invaluable project. And our reader today will be Alexis Green. She is a California State University Chico alumna from Los Angeles. She is currently on a mission to write, illustrate, and distribute educational coloring books as the founder of AJG Books, a graphic design and book publishing service. All right, can, ev can everyone hear me? Yes, perfect. Yes. So good afternoon or evening. My name is Alexis Green. I'll be reading an excerpt from Murder Incorporated, Empire, Genocide, and Manifest Destiny by Mumia Abu Jamal and Stephen Vittoria. A segment from book three, Perfecting Tyranny, chapter six, Stasi 2.0. Citizens commissioned to investigate the FBI. On 8 March 1971, 110 miles away from Media, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier were pummeling each other in Madison Square Garden. The eyes of the world were focused on the fight of the century, but that evening in Media, a, si a sleepy Hamlet residence called Everyone's Hometown, a daring break-in was underway at a small FBI field office. More than 1,000 classified documents were retrieved by a small group of passionate American citizens who were active in both the civil rights and anti-war movements, ardent dissenters against the, wa uh, the wanton murder in Southeast Asia, as well as the domestic terrorist actions underfoot by a U.S. intelligence community hostile to the recently slain MLK, civil rights, black liberation, as well as other groups fighting for justice. This tight group known as the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI knew it was time to do, some, to do more than protest. As Ali peppered Smoke and Joe with a barrage of stinking jabs and Joe countered with the historic left hook that sent the Louisville lip crashing to the canvas, the Bureau's option was about to be revealed by eight activists who broke into the tiny FBI office and gathered up every document they could find. Among the documents, reports Doc Democracy Now! was one that bore the mysterious word Cointel Pro. One of the activists slash burglars, John Rains, acknowledges the group, the group consisted of whistleblowers before a whistleblower had entered the lexicon. He also knew citizens had to do something bold, something intrepid. Yes, something intrepid because Hoover, besides being diabolical, was also untouchable. He had presidents who were afraid of him, Reigns explains. Nobody was holding him accountable and that meant somebody had to get objective evidence of what his FBI was doing. Get their files and get what they're doing in their own handwriting. At the time, Betty Metzger, Metzger was a reporter for the Washington Post. Shortly after the break-in, she received the cache of documents from Liberty Publications with a letter from the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI, explaining when, where, when, and why the stash of evidence was collected. Metzger was shocked and stunned by the trail of criminal behavior perpetrated by the Bureau, and it quickly became apparent to the reporter that Hoover's FBI was especially fond of conducting, quote, blanket surveillance of African-American people, unquote. The documents detailed surveillance programs in nearby Philadelphia, as well as various national programs. The documents also revealed that the illicit spying and counterintelligence was ubiquitous throughout the community. Churches, classrooms, stores down the street, just everything. In fact, the FBI was grooming informants in every walk of life, all of them targeting domestic dissenters. The revelations also exposed the FBI's directive to, quote, enhance the paranoia, unquote, of anti-war 
activists through harassment, intimidation, rumors, lies, and in installing agent provo pro provocators everywhere. The surveillance, quote, the surveillance was so enormous, unquote, explains Metzger, that it led the various people, rather sedate people in editorial offices and in Congress, to compare it to the Stasi, the dreaded secret police of East Germany. The eight media whistleblowers protected their anonymity for more than 40 years, forcing the press and public to focus on the substantive content rather than the worn out and predictable debate over whether the burglars were treasonous or not, as was the case with Daniel Ellsberg and the release of his Pentagon papers just three months later. On that fateful night, Frazier narrowly beat Ali. And while the two warriors nursed their wounds in a building anchored between 7th Avenue and 34th Street, eight other warriors set up shop in a Pennsylvania farmhouse and dropped a dime on the Bureau's ugly and illegal operation. The exposure of Hoover's massive and secretive Pro hijinks, along with his iniquitous violations of civil liberties, helped pave a way for the notable church committee headed by Senator Frank Church of Idaho <laughs> that investigated the entire spectrum of US intelligence operations. In fact, the church committee's damning report triggered various congressional intelligence oversight committees, including the House Select Committee on Assassinations, as well as the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, or FISA, which as we've seen, sort of, kept US surveillance in check for a short time. As expected, control by FISA waned as the various agencies kicked back. And then the subsequent reform, me reform measures dramatically dried up with the election of Ronald Reagan. But on 8th of March in 1971, in the quiet suburbs west of Philadelphia, eight courageous men and women with ice in their veins decided to hell with civil obedience and put everything on the line in an audacious move to alert their fe fellow citizens that treachery was underfoot. In a move that defined self-sacrifice, these eight unexpected swashbuckling activists bring to mind the essence of William Kunstler's words when he spoke of the tragedy, courage, and death at Kent State University. So these were his words. The four who died here, the nine who were wounded here, they did more for their country than all the Nixons and the Agnews, Agnews, I believe, and the Reagans could possibly do. End excerpt. Thank you, Alexis. So um, we will go on to the next testimony. And that is a short video, also from an older woman. Her name is Susan Gossman. She has been a lifelong activist for social justice and peace. She is testifying here on her family history of the US Cold War and McCarthyism. Hello, my name is Susan Gossman. I understand you're asking what life was like during the Cold War. You should know at the outset that I am not a student of history, nor am I particularly great at political analysis. But here's hoping that talking about my experiences and feelings during that time will give you some insight. According to Wikipedia, the dates of the Cold War were 1945 to 1991. But to me, the beginning of the Cold War was March 7th, 1932, the date of the Fort Hunger March. The march took place years before I was born, but because my father was one of its organizers, I have always accepted it as part of my history and the names of the three young men, Coleman Lenny, Joe York, organizer of the Michigan Young Communist League, and Joe de Blasio, killed by Ford's private police force, stay etched in my memory. A year later, C. Williams, a black worker, died from wounds received that day. That violence was set off at gunpoint by Harry Bennett, head of Ford's murderous service department. I was born on January 1st, 1944. World War II would soon be over, 
the Fort Hunger March was behind us, the Rosenbergs were alive, and Joseph McCarthy had not yet required my father's presence at one of his infamous hearings. So, what was my life like during the Cold War years? My family had been party members for many years. I remember meetings, bazaars, fundraising parties, and sing-alongs. Being taken to see Salt of the Earth, another movie with Charlotta Bass and Paul Robeson, my mother explaining from each to each, and telling me communism would not be a reality for many generations. The 50s for me are framed by the Rosenbergs' execution in 1953 and by Joseph McCarthy. My father appeared before HUAC in 1958. The feeling was there may have been a connection between his subpoena and the fact that he had been an organizer of a PW Bazaar. It was an exciting and scary time. I felt that I had been accepted into a special secret society and anti-communist fervor was high. At school, I was asked if I was a communist when I said my grandparents were from Russia. I learned not to say I was Jewish and to keep my mouth shut whenever communism was mentioned. If you were Jewish, you were ridiculed, asked why you didn't have a big nose, if you were rich, and on and on and on. Communists, my friends had been taught, wanted to conquer the world. They were as evil as Nazis. Here's an excerpt from the annual report for the year 1958, prepared and released by the Committee on Un-American Activities, U.S. House of Representatives, Washington, D.C., which compares communists to Nazis. I found it while doing some research for this uh, little presentation, and my anger at reading it is so intense I can still feel it. So they, communists, like the Nazis, divide people into those who deserve to exist and others who don't. And just like the Nazis, they proceed to exterminate, break, suppress all those who do not fit the image of the ruling class. Just like the Nazi state, the communist state is one in which murder has been elevated to the dignity of governmental policy. So 1958, when I was 14, was quite a year. One weekend morning, as my parents slept in, there was a knock on our door. I answered to two men in suits and hats. Is your father home, one said. He's at work, I answered. Then, glimpsing his car in the driveway, I said, oh, just a minute, and went to wake him up. Well, those men were FBI agents, and they served my dad papers to appear before HUAC. They asked for my mother, but dad growled, you'll have to find her yourselves and shut the door in their faces. And the next thing I knew, we were packing our clothes, and I was crying my heart out, scared and ashamed at what I thought I had done. We spent the summer hiding out at Alamitos Bay in Long Beach. My father continued to work and joined us on weekends. My sister and I were told to say our last name was Schaefer, if anyone asked. And in case you think all was grim in Long Beach, I'll share a little story with you. My sister had become friendly with a little girl her age, and, and when it became time for her family to leave, the two decided to exchange phone numbers. Each took a piece of paper to write their name and phone number. As they were doing this, all of a sudden, my, my sister looked up and said, Hey, Mom, how do you spell Schaefer? But this is far-reaching stuff. Imagine my shock when, as president of my union chapter, I learned that many of my union quote, comrades, still believe in the evil of communism. And a dear friend believes that there is no free will under communism and that communists will break and suppress all those who do not fit the image of the ruling class. And of course, this year, January 6, brought us concrete and horrible proof of the staying power of this abomination. Now let's be clear. The fight for good and right will go on and it will be one. So I end this by quoting my great, great Aunt Mary. It is from a letter she wrote to her daughter, Sylvia, in 1970. Aunt Mary was 90 then, and this is what she writes. My life was not wasted, and in my small way, I feel I contributed a little bit for progress, 
not just for myself and mine, but for others too. This is the way I live and the way I wish to be remembered by my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And maybe some others will remember me too, if for nothing else than for my belief in Marxism and that I tried my best to live up to it. For this, I consider myself happy. She ends the letter by saying, I never did learn to spell, but I can think. Love, Mary. Thank you, Susan, for that testimony submitted now into the record. Our next testifier will be Gregory Godels, and he is an author with ML Today. Marxism Leninism Today is the electronic journal of Marxist Leninist thought. Gregory? Great. Um, this is a great event, and this is a needed event. I, I can't speak to how, how needed this is. In my opinion, probably the greatest obstacle to progress in our time uh, today is to overcome the twin evils of anti-communism and racism. I think they are the obstacles to our moving forward. Uh, I appreciate the invite. Um, too often when you study uh, anti-communism in the United States, it's relegated to the celebrities, the Hollywood 10 professors that were repressed or uh, liberals who were painted with the same brush and were unfairly uh, treated as though they were communists and persecuted accordingly. Very few uh, studies are devoted to the small people, the little people that in fact were communists. And um, they're often nameless victims. There were thousands, maybe 10,000s of them in the course of, of the Cold War. Pittsburgh, where I live, uh, is an area that was hit particularly hard for several reasons. One reason because the Communist Party here had a large working class character. Um, it represented many ethnic groups and had strong black membership and leadership in the area. In addition, of course, this is a center, Pittsburgh's a center of corporate America and that made it a particularly hot area. For that reason, a commentator like David Caught in his book, The Great Fear, the Anti-Communist Purge under Truman and Eisenhower described Pittsburgh as the epicenter of the repression in a chapter entitled, Hell in Pittsburgh. Well, I can't name all the victims, I wish I could. Um, most are long forgotten. I did have the privilege of meeting many of those victims when I came to Pittsburgh in 1969. They suffered job losses, public shaming, the loss of friends in their relationships. Some went to jail. I can't mention more than a few, but I'd like to give you the flavor. I think their names um, should not be missing from history. Unfortunately, they, they, uh, they, they have been. One was uh, Becky Horowitz. She was a housewife. Her husband was a plumber in the Communist Party. She was petitioning on, uh, for ballot status for the Communist Party in the, in the 30s. The Pittsburgh Press, one of our then local newspapers, they competed for this kind of activity printed the names, the addresses, and the occupations of all the petitioners. And that was put in, out to the public in order to um, embarrass these people. She was arrested for falsifying petitions because the authorities had then gotten people to attest that they were offered things if they would sign a petition, or they were threatened or bullied to sign a petition. The Communist Party in Western Pennsylvania decided not to contest these arrests because they did not want to embarrass or bring forth charges against the people that were making them, even though they were victimizing people. Becky, in her case, she had a, a young son in school, went to jail for six or eight months uh, based upon the, uh, this, this, this anti-communism. A couple of wonderful, wonderful people that I met when I moved here that, uh, and the most integrity that I, I've ever experienced, Alan Thomas and Joseph Sonny Robinson. They both worked at Crucible Steel in Pittsburgh. They're both steel workers, both elected union officials. They had, they had things planted in their lockers. The police came in, they arrested them, they fired them, they lost their jobs. Um, they were left to find some kind of other employment. In the case of Alan, it's a funny, funny incident. 
he appealed this to this union and he petitioned the union on a third occasion. They asked him if he supported the second front. If you follow World War II politics, you know the second front was when most people in this country wanted to see the US attack the Germans and form a second front as, uh, to fight the Germans when the Soviets were carrying the, the burden of the war. And of course he says he was really for a second front in Mississippi. Uh, that went over like a lead balloon and he was not allowed to get back his job. Another old comrade was Leon Swimmer, a baker. He was a young man and along with a number of uh, progressives and communists decided they were going to integrate a pool in Pittsburgh. Pools were all, all the public pools were segregated. So they went to Highland Park, a small area in Pittsburgh, and they jumped in the pools, they were chased out. Leon was beaten, beaten badly as a consequence of this, but, but that's, it was one of the shining moments of his life in his fight. And maybe the most egregious example is Lou Bortz. He was an absolutely wonderful human being a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, a veteran of World War II, that is living as an appliance repairman. He was called before the McCarthy hearings, not HUAC, not the House Un-American Activity Committee, but the McCarthy hearings, appeared without a lawyer, he was charged with planning the assassination of Senator McCarthy. Uh, the same day he, he appeared, a Jewish American, the Rosenbergs were executed. So you can imagine the atmosphere at that time. As a result of this, of course, he lost his jobs. He tried to, uh, lost his family, alienated his friends, uh, hacked out a living. Um, these were all victims of other personalities in Pittsburgh whose names should never be forgetten, forgotten. And they were the snitches. They were the, they were the uh, informers, Harvey Matuso, Joseph Mazai, Mats Vedic. As time proceeded, as, these, as the courts generated and, and went through these, uh, these cases, they were all identified as liars, alcoholics, unreliable, and so on. But the damage was done to these people and hundreds of other people in Pittsburgh. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting them. I had the pleasure of knowing these people, and they were some of the greatest people I ever met. But what they went through was unconscionable. But more unconscionable is the fact that the legacy, their legacy, and the legacy of others remains uh, undefended, unnoticed, unacknowledged. I'm reminded of a Pittsburgh songwriter, folk singer that you all know, I'm sure, Ann Feeney, uh, a people singer who died recently. And she had a song, she has a song, she's dead, but she has a song about uh, where she asked, who was jailed for justice? I wish she had written another stanza and that stanza would have been, who has been persecuted, scandalized, who has been lost their job, lost their family, their friends, who has been jailed uh, uh, for, for, uh, and, and surveilled by the FBI, who has an FBI number. And I'm very proud to say that having known these people, I got my own uh, FBI number. So I, I am immortalized too in the files of the FBI and proud to be. And I, I, I ask that people now, so-called progressives today, who are seeing the FBI as heroes, seeing them as heroes, revisit this era, revisit this history, and learn who the FBI really is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gregory. And it's great to see you. I, we've chatted, and I, I really love your writing on ML Today. Um, this is an amazing, amazing uh, book. I just spent three straight days yeah. reading it. A conspiracy so immense. Uh, it was one of the things that spurred me to, you know, to, to a few of us to start this a few years ago. So it's a, a frightening, frightening book. Um, uh, so we will have another uh, testifier and it is, he is Richard Moser. He is a historian and recent uh, America, you know, of recent America, and author of the New Winter Soldiers, GI and veteran descent during the Vietnam era. Moser also worked as a staff organizer for District 65, the American Association of University Professors, and the American Federation of Teachers. You can follow his writing at befreedom.co. Hi, I'm Richard Moser. 
I'm an activist and an organizer and a historian of recent America. You can follow my work at befreedom.co and in the pages of Counterpunch. My contribution to the Cold War Truth Commission today is going to be talking about the domestic impacts of the Cold War. The American people lost the Cold War. We did. Because under the cover of the Cold War and anti-communism, the U.S. established itself as the dominant global empire, which immediately led to a series of institutional and systematic changes that killed off the last remnants of democratic and constitutional government. We paid a very high price for the Cold War. After World War II, the American people were tired, tired of fighting. Truman was convinced that he had to scare the hell out of people, and he did. That's just what he did. So evil was the Soviet Union, so alien was their way of life, that the Red Scare summons up its opposite, America and American identity as innocent, good, chosen, and exceptional. Our new enemy was made out to be an existential threat, even though they had just lost 20 million people in World War II, fighting by our side against Nazi Germany. And our global superiority was based upon the fact that all our competitors were crushed in the war. Our empire was the last in a long line of European empires, because we assimilated and reorganized the broken pieces of the British Empire, the French, and yes, the German Nazi Empire. We assimilated that too. So Cold War anti-communism was really like ruling class magic. Because under its hypnotic spell, uh, people stopped seeing the empire at all. It made the empire disappear. We were not, according to the official story, an empire at all, but the world's greatest democracy defending the free world from communism. But no justification could hide forever the fact that the empire changed the United States. A new form of government came to be that was often called the national security state. These changes were sweeping. They decisively undermined uh, checks and balances, uh, separation of powers, and the rule of law. Soon the executive branch grew far beyond anything the Constitution had ever called for, and it turned into what we sometimes call the imperial presidency, a new tyrannical executive branch. You know, I mean, the United States president has wars powers that uh, a king would be jealous of. Even though the Constitution is crystal clear, only Congress can declare war. You all know that we have not had a declared war since World War II. And once that keystone is removed and surrendered, that power surrendered by Congress, the remaining edifice of the Constitution and of the Republic, which was never strong to begin with, began to crumble. Tyranny was soon to follow. You know, it's an old story after all, how empires destroy the republics that give them birth. Another part of these institutional changes was the rise of militarism. Before the Korean War, the United States had no standing army. We had a small army and an officer corps, and armies were raised through the draft. And when the war was over, the soldiers were sent home. There was no military industrial complex. There were auto factories and airplane factories, and they were converted to wartime use and converted back. There, of course, there were war profiteers, but never a powerful permanent war industry directly bonded to government. So we have a violent warlike past, but we're not militarists, and there is, that's an important distinction. Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, was so disturbed by what he saw that he warned us in his farewell address. And I'm going to read a short quote from it. The conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We should take nothing for granted. And Eisenhower was the last president to speak honestly about this to the American people. So today, war is big, big business, and the MIC has only grown. Uh, since 9-11 and the first Gulf War, the military-industrial complex now includes hundreds of security and intelligence corporations, including the big tech. 
Another part of this institutional shift is the emergence of secret police forces. During the Cold War, there was a rapid growth of secret police forces. We now have 18 of them. Of course, we call them the intelligence community. That's a euphemism. These are secret police forces, and they are real players in domestic politics in the United States, intervening in our own elections, and suppressing free speech by spying routinely on millions of Americans. According to those documents liberated by Edward Snowden, they spy on us more than they spy on Russians and more than they spy on Chinese. How do we explain that? You probably remember from the last um, primary that the night before the Nevada caucus, the intelligence community comes out and says that Bernie Sanders is the choice of the Russians. They offer no evidence. They never did, never have. That is a gross violation of their power, abuse of their power. So the imperial presidency, militarism, secret police forces, these have had a profound effect. And that effect is to hollow out the remnants of the US Constitution and, and the American Republic. So tyranny is the price of empire, always has been, always will be. But empires are shot through with contradictions and they're very difficult to maintain. So one of the key things maintaining empire, holding it together, like the republic it destroyed, is whiteness, is white racial identities. Because white racism has long been the primary form of class collaboration in which everyday white people identify with the ruling class instead of with their fellow workers. Now over the centuries there's been uh, white privileges and they were sometimes quite substantial. And it allowed white people to think that the government was on our side and that we were part of it. But maintaining whiteness is now caught on the horns of a dilemma, of an imperial dilemma. Because the empire strives for full spectrum dominance, to use their own term. They want to dominate everything at every level. And the corporations are driven by a very similar imperative which is maximum possible profits, not profits, maximum possible profits. So these two imperatives demand austerity from the entire working class, including the white working class. And that's the dilemma they're in and we're in too. The 45 years of austerity that begin in the mid 1970s works contrary to the special material benefits needed to win over whites and other people. And if my interpretation is correct, then the empire destroys the last vestiges of democratic government, even for whites, and puts whiteness on a path to decline, if not its ultimate distinction. The recent failure of government to raise wages to even the paltry sum of $15 an hour is a prime example of the dilemma faced by the rulers. And they chose austerity again, because that $15 would raise wages for the entire working class, something they simply cannot allow. So when you see millions of uh, people, white workers, young white workers, out protesting at BLM last summer, I think part of it is motivated by the realization that they too have no future. And that making common cause with blacks is far smarter than waiting on the government. Now the only play left for the ruling class since it is unable to provide material advantages, is to increase what W.E.B. Du Bois called the psychological wage. So they can't provide material wages, so they must provide psychological wages. And what that means is we're going to have more and more toxic forms of white supremacy from the Trump Republicans and the neo-fascist gangs, and more shallow and transparent forms of corporate identity from the Democrats and corporate Republicans. Both are ploys to create a vertical cross-class alliance bonding working people to the existing order. Just as important, the ruling class is going to try and solve its internal problems with the new Cold War. Like the old Cold War, the new one is going to be driven by fear, first and foremost fear, but also mass conspiracy theories in which Russiagate, QAnon have replaced the uh, old international communist conspiracy. And of course, it is also driven 
by the shared glory of world supremacy. But this time, it must encourage white people and others to, to revel in the greatness of empire with a bare minimum of material rewards and benefits. I'm not sure it's going to work. But maybe this is why a majority of Americans are tired of war. On the other hand, the war propaganda for the new Cold War is powerful. It is bipartisan, and it is working. Can the new Cold War satisfy the psychological payoff to keep whites and others in line without significant material payoffs? This crisis and opportunity it presents for a new peace movement is why an anti-imperialist perspective is so important. And one of the reasons this view has also been so marginalized. But the opportunities for peace and democracy awaits us if we can intervene in this crisis of empire. Well, thanks for having me and thanks for listening. And again, you can follow my work at befreedom.co. Thank you. Mickey Huff is a professor of social science, history, and journalism, chair of journalism, co-chair of history at Diablo Valley College in California. He is director of the Media Watchdog uh, Project Censored and president of its parent nonprofit, the Media Freedom Foundation. Recently, he was co-author of the United States of Distraction, Media Manipulation in Post-Truth America and What We Can Do About It. And he's the co-editor of Project Censored's State of the Free Press 2021. Mickey, you're on. Thanks so much for, for having me. Um, uh, of course, Code Pink, Frank, Rachel, all of you, thanks so much for this very, very important, momentous, historic event itself about the significance of, of history. And so again, it's, so it's a real honor uh, to be here with so many wonderful people, many of whom I know um, and others whom I haven't met that I greatly admire. Um, you know, teaching history matters, and that's what I do. I'm sort of at the intersection of both history and journalism, recent historiography, and the importance of journalism, more specifically independent truth-telling journalism that speaks truth to power and speaks truth as power. And I'm going to repeat again that teaching history matters. Um, censoring the truth during the U.S. Cold War up to the present is the title of the brief presentation today. Um, so I'm going to kind of pack in a number of things that uh, that I think are pretty significant. Um, uh, there's been so many fantastic people uh, before me here today that have mentioned a lot of these things, so I don't want to be too redundant. A number of fantastic people to follow, including my great friend Peter Phillips, the former director of Project Censored. Um, you know, uh, William Faulkner once wrote that the past is never dead, it's not even past. And it's so important for us to acknowledge that. Um, Mark Twain quipped once upon a time, um, that history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. Uh, and we are certainly in uh, a Dr. Seuss moment historiographically, never mind the fact that Dr. Seuss is back in the news for other reasons. <laughs> um, we'll uh, talk about that maybe some other time. Um, you know, I'd also like to riff uh, briefly here with a nod too to the Covert Action Quarterly folks. Um, you know, paraphrasing Ralph McGeehee, the great CIA whistleblower, today's fake news is tomorrow's fake history. And so yesterday's fake history frames today's fake news. <laughs> so this is a Cold War redux feedback loop, right? And um, what is fake news again? It's nothing new. It's misinformation. It's disinformation. It's propaganda. It's information control. And you go back to the 1960s, you recall the Grams over at the Washington Post. Um, yeah, yes, that's still the CIA paper of record with uh, Jeff Bezos and the $600 million cloud contract they've gotten. Um, uh, journalism is the first rough draft of history. Uh, and if that's the case, we really need to get it right the first time. And I don't mean with the disinformation that we saw in these legacy papers buttressing Cold War propaganda. I mean, you know, going back to George Seldes and I.F. Stone, meaning that the role of journalists is to tell the public what's actually going on. And if we do go back in our history and the independent alternative annals of our past, we have long had truth tellers. We've long had people telling us what was happening, whether it's long before the Cold War, during or since in its next or new recent iteration. So, um, you know, the Cold War itself is sometime in the making, officially 45 years long, but the actual hostility toward Russia or communism or specifically long predates the Cold War. 
um, the real reasons for our hostilities against civil rights and labor movements in the United States were long shrouded. Uh, it's been through xenophobia, fear of immigration, fear of taking jobs, fear of invasion, fear of rivals trying to threaten to take Americans' freedom. Um, none of those things have actually really been true. And this is why we need untold histories to be told with a nod to Peter Kuznick and Oliver Stone, Peter earlier today, um, speaking with everyone. So if you go back and follow this hostility rooted in US oppression against civil rights and labor movements, wage slavery, pro-capitalist plutocratic forces go way back before the Civil War. We heard that earlier today too with the abolitionist women and so on, really ramped up significantly with the Haymarket Massacre in 1886. Right, there's a gross hostility towards labor rights and this type of actual freedom in our history. There's a strong anti-capitalist um, uh, sort of fear that the establishment has that they want to cramp down. And so that predates the Cold War specifically. You know, we saw it during the, um, you know, working with the police at the Haymarket Square, working with private Pinkertons and places like Homestead and other places all the way up through the beginning of the FBI, later COINTELPRO. Um, there's been a serious effort to control narratives and suppress narratives that don't jive with the fear, the fear mongering that takes place from the top down. And so, um, you know, the US is of course in, involved not only in the suppression of critics during World War I at home, you know, but the US also meddled in the Bolshevik revolution. The whole first red scare that spawned the Soviet arc Right, um, the hostility against people um, from Emma Goldman to presidential candidate socialists like Eugene Debs, uh, the Espionage and Sedition Act, largely aimed not just to suppress critics of World War One, but to suppress critics of pro-capitalism and to suppress any support for the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, you go, uh, you know, this, by the way, is a story that's been told by filmmakers like Scott Noble, uh, just directed a brand new series called The War at Home that I highly recommend I wrote a review for, and you can see it at projectcensored.org. There are many folks, as I'm saying, that have talked about the history of suppression and the suppression uh, of the truth in our historiographic narratives. Um, but historically, you know, World War I was really a big kickoff. That's where we saw Eddie Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, working with the Creel Commission to fashion false narratives uh, against Germany at the time, but also those morphed into anti-Russia, anti-Soviet, anti-communism type narratives. Um, you know, if you go back and look what Bernays said in 1928, the conscious and intelligent manipulation and organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in, quote, democratic society, right? And it is this un, these uh, who, those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the truling power of the country. It is they who pull the wires, which control the public mind. And it is from that period forward, right, that we will see this effort to control narratives, right? Where is it gone down the memory hole of the 1934 business plot to overthrow FDR, who claimed he saved capitalism at ATAs? He's not even a socialist, right? Uh, Smedley Butler, the most decorated Marine in U.S. history, warned us that war was a racket, not about democracy, not about liberation, but it was about, uh, about suppression of people's movements for actual freedom and economic uh, liberty. So, you know, this is a long-standing conflict that we see coming through the Great Depression. It led, of course, to, you know, the U.S., don't forget, during this period, supported major corporations in the U.S., supported the rise of Hitler to power, supported the Nazis in Germany against the Soviet Union at the time. Um, and then, of course, we significantly ramped up our efforts against the Soviet Union again at the ending of World War II with the bombing of Japan, as Peter Kuznick and Oliver Stone point out, uh, the betrayal of Henry Wallace and so forth. So we have a rich history that tells these stories, but we don't really get to teach it. Not enough people teach this, this history moving forward. And it's important that we do because the Cold War is a long period of our time that was marked by the murder of tens of millions of people, the suppression of the rights of millions of people at home, further collaboration with Nazis and neo-Nazis from Operation Paperclip all the way through with the Klan, all the way through the Obama-Biden administration with working with neo-Nazis in Ukraine. This is our un- told history. After World War II, we get the second Red Scare under McCarthy, building off of the House on american Activities Committee, the ramping up of COINTELPRO, the suppression of anti-war and civil rights movement, the lies of the Gulf of Tonkin incident that Norm Solomon uh, eloquently points out in his work, um, 
that he compares and uh, compares with the WMD's lies. You know, again, there's been a long raft of propaganda suppression and lies that are all in maintenance of the U.S. as a corporation, as a major global hegemon, right? Vietnam, one of the longest of those, uh, including the Kent State uh, oppression, the killing of people at Kent State. We see all the way through COINTELPRO, through the church committee hearings, only to re-kick off another kind of Cold War raft in the 1980s against uh, mostly uh, the Middle East and Latin and South America. Again, history may not repeat itself, but surely it seems to rhyme. The war on drugs is a big part of this, as we heard earlier, uh, and great truth tellers and whistleblowers like Gary Webb calling attention to that. We've only seen this uh, sort of get doubled down in the so-called war on terror era, where the same playbook has been used over and over and over to demonize countries, and Russia has been back in that playbook for the last decade. So I would like, again, to remind everybody that this, this serious ramping up of the anti-Russia is a, is a throwback to a Cold War that is not actually ended. We see it now with open threats against Russia, calling Putin a killer, which perhaps, of course, he is. But that doesn't exonerate the U.S. or NATO that have been further expanding and is responsible for the deaths of millions of people, uh, even since the so-called ending of the Cold War in Iraq, in the Middle East. These are real, serious, and ongoing problems that we really need to turn our attention to. The latest iteration of this in Russian meddling and this canard, I know will be addressed later by people like David Swanson, most recently by Matt Taibbi. Um, we really need to call on their face these bald-faced lies. We need to call them for what they are. We need to really support pro-democracy and freedom movements, not just at home, but abroad. And we need to not succumb to the fear-mongering of this third red scare, as we have called it and wrote, written about it in Counterpunch and the work we've done at Project Censored, continues to call out these bogus and false top-down narratives and maintenance of US power. So I know my time is up, but I'd like to remind us all that a better world is possible. Organizations that sponsored this event and put them on make it possible, but we can't do it without understanding our history. And in order to understand our history, we have to uncensor it and we need journalistic integrity in the present that goes back and resurrects that history so that we can have more contextualized narratives in the present that call out the current lies and propaganda moving forward. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for all the amazing work you do. And you can follow more of our work at projectcensored.org. R G. Many thanks to all of you. Right on. <laughs> Woo. Wonderful. Very, very um, inspiring. Uh, we have a dear friend of mine organized for a long time with me, or I have with him. Uh, he is co. He is pretty much the head of uh, lead organizer with San Pedro Neighbors for Peace and Justice which is a group that started right after the second invasion of Iraq and has been done many things but has uh, been on the corner in downtown san pedro for over 850 fridays after our invasion of iraq um speaking truth to power and peace in the streets and the 98 year old woman that i mentioned before julia scoville uh she was right there along with them uh for for years and years and years so chris venn will speak on a very very important uh part of the cold war Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to speak um, on the housing crisis, land accumulation, and Cold War ideology. And I'm going to focus on Ronald Reagan and his and the part he, he played. Um, uh, under Reagan, the number of homeless people went from something so little, it wasn't even written about uh, widely in the late 1970s, to more than 2 million when Reagan left office. The single most devastating thing Reagan did to create homelessness was when he cut the budget for the Department of Housing and Urban Development by three quarters, from 32 billion in 1981 to 7.5 billion by 1988. Um, I, I wanna step back from my remarks. As Rachel mentioned, we're, we're a group called San Pedro Neighbors for Peace and Justice. So we've been on the street corner as, as Rachel men, mentioned for 850 Fridays. We stopped because of the uh, COVID pandemic out of concern for 
for our fellow activists and also not to give the wrong impression that somehow, you know, as peace, peace activists, we wanted to, uh, you know, display any casual attitude toward this horrible pandemic. Um, so as, as social justice activists, we belong to a group, by the way, we're in California, um, uh, part of Los Angeles. We're a part of, part of a group of 37 different organizations called Services Not Sweeps. It, it refers to um, um, actions by the Los Angeles Police Department and the Department of Sanitation to attack un, uh, and destroy unhoused uh, encampments uh, throughout the city. For To share with you, um, Los Angeles has the largest unhoused community for a city in the country. Um, but um, so that that's kind of our why why Rachel asked for this presentation about about uh, about Ronald Reagan. Um, so as I mentioned, the the uh, Department of Housing and Urban <clears throat> Development uh, uh, dropped by three quarters from 32 billion in 1981 to 7.5 billion by 1988, all at Reagan's uh, uh, urging. <clears throat> the, the, the department was the main governmental supporter, this uh, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development was the main governmental supporter of subsidized housing for the poor. Add to this was Reagan's overhaul of tax codes to reduce incentives for private developers to create low income homes. And you had a major crisis for low income families and individuals. <clears throat> Under Reagan, the number of people living beneath the federal poverty line rose from 24.5 million in 1978 to 32.5 million in 1988, all under Reagan's watch. <clears throat> uh, also under his watch, the income gap between the rich and everyone else in America widened. Wages for the average worker declined and the nation's home ownership rate fell. During Reagan's two terms in the White House, which were boom times for the rich, the, pro the poverty rate in cities grew. <clears throat> Reagan also presided, so there's, there's a, but this isn't simply uh, a question of, of, you know, the, the uh, uh, loss of, of housing, but just the whole restructuring of, of government under Reagan. Um, Reagan also presided over the dramatic deregulation of the nation's savings and loan industry, allowing SNLs to end their reliance on home mortgages and engage in an orgy of commercial real estate speculation. The result was widespread corruption, mismanagement, and the collapse of hundreds of thrift institutions that ultimately led to a taxpayer bailout that cost hundreds of billions of dollars. <clears throat> By the end of Reagan's term in office, federal assistance to local governments was cut 60%. Reagan eliminated general revenue sharing to cities, slashed funding for public service jobs and job training, almost dismantled federally funded legal services for the poor, cut the the anti-poverty community development block grant program and reduced funds for public transit. The most dramatic cut in domestic spending during the Reagan years was for low income housing subsidies. Reagan appointed a housing task force dominated by politically connected developers, landlords and bankers. In 1982, the task force released a report that called for free and deregulated markets as an alternative to government assistance. Advice Reagan followed. In his first year in office, Reagan halved the budget for public housing and Section 8 
to 17.5 billion. And for the next few years, he sought to eliminate federal housing assistance to the poor altogether. Um, sorry to be so wonky. Uh, I, I wanted to just give a plug for this wonderful book that, that uh, has been the source of some of these remarks called Mean Streets, a book recently, 2020, uh, released by Don Mitchell. Just a real eye-opening uh, look at kind of the history of, of homelessness in this country, which goes back, you know, over a hundred years. So just finally to, to summarize, um, and again, it's such a pleasure to be here. With the Reagan revolution, tent cities returned, already declining during the Carter administration, during the Carter administration, these tent cities were declining. The public housing budget was cut in half in the first Reagan budget and slashed and slashed again over the years that followed. Disability and mental health support budgets were likewise slashed and were, were um, had the horrible legacy of, of Reagan uh, cutting mental health support in, in California. And the inevitable effects of unsupported deinstitutionalization quickly made themselves in, in cities. Uh, and just so finally, deindustrialization played its role. Loss of jobs, um, uh, closing of, of factories, uh, eliminating jobs and livelihoods, leading to foreclosures and sending thousands of workers and their families out on the road looking for better opportunities. All these processes hit people of color the hardest. Um, that's it, and thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for your testimony. And I would just say to a capitalist, perhaps the greatest crime of socialism is the idea that housing has is a human right or that land is a human right. So all of the land reform movements around the world that tried to come after after you know, World War II that uh, were crushed as communists, that's one of the, the worst things you can do is give land or housing to someone. Um, thank you so much. Uh, free? My goodness. Uh -huh.